Good morning, North Road. Let's go Jesus way this morning. Let's put our hands together. We're giving it all away. We're giving it all to go your way. We're giving it all away, away. We're giving it all to go your way. In the Father, there is freedom, there is hope in the name that is Jesus. Lay your life down, give it all now. We are found in the love of a Savior. We've come alive in you, set free to show the truth. Our lives will never be the same. Everything that we are for your glory. Take our hearts now, have it all now. Let our life shine your light like the morning. We've come alive in you, set free to show the truth. Our lives will never be the same. Give it up to this morning, sing. We're giving it all away. away. We're giving. Put your hands together. You roll back the curtains from our eyes. Now we can see you. you Showed us your way, your truth, and life. We offer our lives to bring you fame. We come your freedom we're caught in your freedom we're giving it all away we're giving it all to go your way we're giving it all
Everybody, before we do the next song, I wanted to say something really quick or ask a question, really. Who has seen the I Can Only Imagine movie that's come out? Can we make some noise? Come on. Right? Okay. So I was stupid and asked Daniel, hey, we should do that song. And he puts it on the schedule like the next week. And I wasn't mentally prepared for it. But he does that all the time. So uh, if you guys have not seen the movie, give a little background on it. The uh, singer for Mercy Me, Bart, has... Uh, had a really, really abusive father, and he just basically says that he was a monster his entire life. Uh, he comes home to find out that his father's actually passing away and sees God work in his life, and his father completely transforms into a different person. And he says over and over again in interviews that you see with him that if my dad was a monster like that, and God can do that in his life. He can do that in anybody's life. So when I hear the song in the car, I always just crank it up and I sing the words. And I, a lot of the times with songs like these that are like anthems for Christian music, you really don't even think about what you're singing because you know the words so easily. So that is one thing that I ask of you guys today is to really focus on what the words mean. Because for me, I grew up with an abusive father. Uh, to hear this song and actually think of the words, there, there's things about music that can completely transform your life. And that's the point of worship up here every Sunday. It's not to just have a concert and then Matt gets up and talks. It's words and songs and music itself can be completely life-changing for somebody out here. So what I really hope is that I can make it through the song without bawling. But if I do, if I do start crying, you guys got to finish it out for me, okay? Before me, I can 
only imagine. By your glory, what will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus? Or in all of you be still? Will I stand in your presence? Or to my knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak it all? I can only imagine. Somebody say that you know and you know That's all I got so I go with the flow and Nobody died playing safe on the ground We'll only fly if we don't look down If we don't look down Well, good morning. How's everybody doing? 
It is good to see you guys. If you've been coming here for a long time, i got to share something with you that's kind of funny. Um, when we were over in the other building, it was like all kinds of hot, and I would sweat and like just sweat, sweat, sweat. They put air conditioners in the floor, and there is an air conditioner vent right here, and I've strategically placed my chair so I will never sweat and gross you out again. So I'm pretty excited about that. That's just pretty awesome. I know, right? Uh, we are in week three in the final days, uh, the final week of our series called Don't Look Down. And to, we have talked about, just to kind of give you an idea of where we've been, um, we've talked about don't look down on your call, don't look down on who you are, uh, and, and today we're going to talk about a really, really important one, and that is don't look down when God calls you to stretch farther. When you look at the idea of stretching farther, here's, here's what I want you to see. There is an all-out war for your eyes. There is an all-out war in this world for your eyes, whether you understand it or not. God wants your eyes fixed on him, the author and finisher of your faith. Satan wants your eyes fixed on the ground, because as we said week after week, the ground is distracting. I, I use this illustration week one just to remind you, but when I get up in an airplane and I look down, that looks like death, and death is distracting, right? And when Satan wants us to look down, the reason he wants us to look down is because he wants us distracted, distracted by the things that he wants us to know that we can't do, or that we aren't capable of, or that we can't overcome, or that we can't wade through, and he wants you distracted, because if you are distracted, then you are off focus of what Christ has called you to do. you got to understand something. Christ has already won the war when he died on the cross for your sins. The devil cannot win battle or win wars anymore. He can only win battles. And the battles that he wins are when our eyes are taken off what they're supposed to be fixed on and fixed on something else. And so I would ask you right now, in your life, what are your eyes fixed on? Are they fixed on the author and finisher of your faith? Or have you gotten distracted? Has, has the things of life happened to you in this all-out war? And have you taken your eyes and kind of shifted them down? If you have, it's okay. I, I think you need to know that. There are, there, every single person in this room, there will be a moment in your life when you shift your eyes towards down. It happens when things don't go well. It happens when our marriage gets jacked up. It happens when something goes wrong at work. It happens when our health fails. It happens when our kids aren't doing what we feel like they should be doing. Or maybe we feel like we didn't do what we need to do as a parent. And instead of fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of what we feel like is so broken, we look down and we go, oh my gosh. And we get to a point where <laughs> we don't know how we got here. All through the Bible, you find people who look down because... We are humans. Humans look down. David looked down when he looked at Bathsheba and committed an affair on his wife. Eve looked down when she ate the apple and, and, and changed the whole creation of the world as we know it. And today we're going to look at one other individual who looked down, but in the midst of looking down, this is what I want you to see, decided at the end to look up. There are some people sitting in this room today, you've been looking down for a long time, and it's time to look back up. It's time to stretch farther for who you are in Christ. It's time to take that next step, to take that risk, to be who Christ has called you to be. And all it's going to be, all it's going to take is you shifting your eyes from the ground and shifting them to the sky. So if you got your Bibles, do me a favor. We're going to look at the Apostle Peter today, and I want to give you a little bit of background of, of what we have talked about when it comes to Peter and what you need to know in order to understand why Peter would be a person that looks down. If you know the story of the Apostle Peter, here's what you should know about him. He was one of the 12 disciples chosen by Jesus, one of the best of the best as we talked last week. God had taken him and said, you're going to follow Jesus for three years, and he was elevated in society. Everybody wanted to be like the Apostle Peter. He was the guy that walked hand in hand with Jesus. There were 12, and then there were three, and Peter was one of the three. As you know, because we talked about it two weeks ago, Peter was the guy who, uh, at the time when Jesus needed him most, denied him three times. And, Peter, and Jesus just kind of even prophesied, hey, Peter, before the rooster crows in the morning, I'm telling you, you are going to deny me three times. And Peter deafeningly denies Jesus as cursing. I don't know that bleeping man. Can you imagine the angst in your heart if you're Peter? When Jesus dies and is buried and rises again and you realize he's God and you just denied the Savior of the world, can you feel like the stress that's going on in that guy's life? We talked about this a couple weeks ago when, when Jesus looked right into the eyes of Peter and said, Peter, do you love me? And, and Peter said that to say, you know I love you, man. Why are you questioning me? For Jesus to question him had to be incredibly painful. 
right? Peter is dealing with all of this distress. Let me ask you a question. Do you ever get to a point where you feel like your rubber band won't go any farther? I got to think in Peter's life, he's at that point at this moment, right, where the rubber band has been stretched out to its max, okay? And then we come to what a lot of people consider one of the most holy verses in the entire Bible. It's when Jesus empowers the disciples to go out and be who he's called them to be. But I read it a different way, and I want to read it with you because I think it really helps us to understand what movement of fixing his eyes on Jesus Peter actually did. Acts chapter 1 Verse 6, here's what it says. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom? Is that the right place? Is that the right place? Got to look at it. Yep, that's it. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? So you got to understand what's going on here. For 40 days, Jesus has died on the cross. He was buried. He was resurrected. He's spending 40 days. And Peter and him are restoring their relationship. Things are starting to get back to normal. Peter's still dealing with some like PTSD from watching his Savior die, from denying him, from being the person that Jesus looked at him and said, do you really love me? I mean, there's major trauma going on in his heart, right? And for 40 days, they've been working on this thing. And so they say to him, so when they come together, they ask him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? And God looks at him and goes, it is not for you to know the time or the seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. If I'm Peter, I'm going, come on, bro. Seriously, it's not my time to know? I mean, do you know what I've been through? Let's be serious. Come on, man. And look what he says next. But you will receive power. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you're going to become my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Man, if I'm Peter, I'm going, dude, I ain't ready for that assignment. I am tired. I just denied you three times. I don't think I'm the guy, man. Pick somebody else. I'm going back to fishing. I don't, oh my gosh, I'm so stressed out right now, right? And then it says this, Acts chapter 1, verse 9. I don't, uh, they had it. And when he said these things, as they were looking on, he lifted up, he, he was lifted up, I'm sorry, Jesus was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. Okay, keep going. Verse 10. And while they were getting their, uh, while they were gazing into the heavens going, what just happened to Jesus, right? I mean, we, we look at that sometimes when we go, man, this is a holy moment. Jesus is going, oh, but I don't think that's how it's happening if I'm Peter. Let's be honest. We're human beings. If Jesus all of a sudden disappeared again and said, hey, dude, you got the job now? And it says he went into the heavens and while they were gazing, behold, two men stood in white robes and said, dude, what are you looking at? Men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking into heaven? The Jesus that was taken from you into heaven will come again, and you got to go do his job right now. Now, think about it. Don't miss this. I, I don't want you to miss this moment. If you're Peter, we look at it sometimes as church people because we're religious, and we go, oh, what a holy moment. Jesus floated away. Man, I'm, if I'm Peter, that's not a holy moment. That is the end of the straw that breaks the camel's back in my life. Because in my life, I'm going, you got to be kidding me, man. I have spent 40 days restoring our relationship. I'm not ready for this moment. I've got major PTSD. I watched them beat you till your guts fell out. I watched them hang you on a cross. I watched you rise again. You asked me all these hard questions about, do I love you? I've committed myself to you, and you're ditching me. That is what, if I'm Peter, I'm just being honest, those are the emotions that are going through my heart. This is not a kumbaya moment for me. I'm going, what in the heck are you doing, God? But can I help you understand something? When God calls you to something great, it is not necessarily going to be on a platter and have roses and unicorns and rainbows. God is going to call you to something bigger than you because if it's not bigger than you, then you can handle it without him. And he doesn't want you to handle it without him. And so sometimes in our life, God allows the rubber, the rubber band of our life to stretch out to its incredible very max. And some of you are dealing with that right now in your life, aren't you? Your marriage isn't going very good. And man, the stress level is just kind of growing. Man, work isn't going very good. People aren't treating you very nice. Your health isn't going very good. People at church just seem to not be the same. And all of a sudden, you just got stretch, 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 stretch. And it's like to the max. And you're like, man, this thing's going to pop at any time. And you're just ready to go, I just need a, I need a break. Can I tell you something? Can I just encourage you in this moment? Satan uses words like anxiety, depression, um, just gossip. He uses um, divorce. He uses harsh words to get you off of your game for following God. If he can use those sentences to convince you that you can't, then he wins and you don't. 
When he can talk you into thinking that you don't have the ability to stretch any farther, it is the moment your eyes go from the prize and they go down on the ground. And sometimes, let's be honest, you have been a Christian for a long time. We answer that instead of going, I quit. We give God the Christian I quit. Man, I just need a break. I just need a rest. You know, if I could just get away from things for a while, I'd be okay. I'm just, I'm just going to step away from all my responsibilities, and maybe at some point I'll go back, right? Let's talk about that for a second. In Genesis chapter 1, God created the heavens and the earth, and it says on the seventh day he what? He rested. We need to take breaks, right? Once a week, we should be chilling out and relaxing and taking breaks. In, in, in the books of the Torah, he says, man, you need to take the Sabbath day and you need to keep it holy. There are times when we need to take a rest, okay? But sometimes as Christians, we'll go, man, I am stretched to the max. I don't know what else to do. And instead of just letting God and do and trusting him and surrendering to him and allowing him to decide what the max is, we just kind of, and the moment we do this, we look down. Why? Because when we rest without a future plan in place, we're not resting, we're quitting. If you're right now in your life going, God, I just need some time, but you don't know what the plan is to get back in the game, you're not resting, you're quitting. And, and I understand that. I've quit before. I've been in the point where I go, hey, God, I don't know what's next, and I'm just going to take a break, and I'm just going to feed myself. Man, let me tell you what feed yourself means. <laughs> and you become a person that doesn't accomplish anything in your life that makes you more like God. Peter had that choice. Peter is in this moment. Do you understand that? Peter had every reason in this moment to go, man, I'm just taking a break. I'm just done. I'm going to go back to fishing for a while. I don't want to do this anymore. I can't take the stress. God, I know you're going to heaven, and I see you floating in a while. That's awesome. But I'm here. What am I supposed to do? My rubber band won't take any more right now, God. He could have easily said that. I think it's interesting. Jesus ascends. There's a day of rest. And then a day later, Peter finds himself in the midst of thousands of people for a festival that's going on. There's, there's tons of people in the area. And all of a sudden, this thing called Pentecost breaks out. Now, to explain Pentecost to you, the Bible does a really clear job of it. Here's what it looked like in that moment, okay? It looked like in that moment there was a group of Christians there, and they started preaching who God was to the people who were there. And when they would talk, whether a person was Asian or Italian or whatever nationality they were and whatever language or dialect they spoke, when a person from Israel would speak the word of God, they would hear it in whatever language they spoke. And it was like uh, this amazing moment of God, Right? And all of a sudden, the people who hated Jesus start going, dude, don't focus on that. They're a bunch of drunks. They're just drunk. They don't know what they're talking about. I don't know how they're doing it, but they're drunk. And I can just see Peter in this moment, right? Rubber band spritz to the max, has no ability to move any farther, right? Feels like his life is maxed out. Just watch Jesus float back into heaven, and he's frustrated about it. And he's got a choice. I can just hide right now because if I step out and I say anything to them about the way they're laughing at us and making fun of us, they are all anti-Jesus people. They are going to kill me. Remember, Peter had just denied Christ like a couple weeks ago. And all of a sudden, here we go. Same scenario for Peter once again. Notice this. When we get out to the max, God is going to give you the same test over and over again. Because there are things he wants to accomplish in your life that are going to make you more like him. And sometimes the only way to get you more like him is to take you back to the edge of the rubber band bust. <laughs> so Peter looks around and all of them are laughing. I can just... Imagine one of those surreal moments where it all is kind of silent, but everybody's kind of screaming around you, and you're kind of just fading out going, oh, no. God, I'm done. I don't know. Noises are happening, but it almost feels silent in your person. And look what Peter does. Acts chapter 2. But Peter, standing with the eleven. Watch this. Takes a step forward in the crowd and says, Men of Judea, all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. 
For these people are not drunk as you suppose they are, since it's only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man arrested by you with mighty works, I'm sorry, arrested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified him and you killed him by the hands of lawless men. In other words, Peter is just kind of, I know I'm at my max, God, but here we go. And he takes this step with his eyes closed and he goes, man, you people killed him. And it had to be one of those surreal moments like, am I really saying this right now? Go to the next verse. And God raised, he says this, he goes, God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not because uh, because it was not possible for him to be held by death. He goes on. Let all the house of Israel therefore know that uh, for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus who you've killed, he is God, in other words. Keep going. Now when they heard this, <laughs> this is awesome, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now watch this. And for this promise is for you and not for your, or not just, this promise is for you and for your children, for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. I love this one. And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, save yourselves from this crooked generation. And what happens? So those who received his words were baptized. And there were added 3,000 people that day to Christ. Don't, don't miss this. Don't miss this huge moment. Peter is at the rubber band break moment. Peter's at the moment where, you know, a lot of us, we just release the elasticity. We take the break. We look down at the ground. We get distracted by it. And all of a sudden, we find ourselves five months later going, how did I get here? Peter is in the moment, the crux, when everybody should look down. And instead of looking down, he closes his eyes and he goes, Men of Jerusalem, here we go. And because he took the next step, 3,000 people came to know Christ. Some of you are ready to quit on your marriage right now. If you took the next step, what could happen? Some of you are struggling right now at work. What if you took the next step? Some of you think you're supposed to tell somebody in your neighborhood about Christ. What if you took the next step? And I know what you're thinking right now. Some of you are like, I'm so maxed out, man. I don't have the ability to stretch farther. If it stretches farther, it's going to bust. You don't have it. But God does. Man, I am so stressed. There's no way I could give up alcohol or drugs right now. Yes, you can. There is no way I could serve God right now. Man, I am so burned out right now. I'm so tired. Yes, you can. You know why you can? Because when we trust God with the stretched out moment, God gives you a bigger rubber band. He gives you more capacity. Can you imagine, just, just think about this, when Peter took that step, he was done. Man, I'm tired, God. I don't know how I'm going to do it, but here we go. Men of Jerusalem, you guys need to know you killed him. It was a bad idea. He's the savior of the world. You guys are idiots. And all of a sudden, they go, oh, man, you're right. That's not a Peter moment. That's a God moment, right? Because then they just crucified Jesus for that like six weeks earlier. It is a God moment. We just call 3,000 people. And all of a sudden, Peter looks at him and he goes, wow. Wow, that, that just kind of filled my heart. I just watched 3,000 people give their heart to God because I was courage or anxious enough to just step up and talk. And all of a sudden, his rubber band that was so at the max was not at the max anymore. Here's a question for you. What's your 3,000 men moment? What's it look like for you? It may mean just a conversation going home with your kids and having a conversation with them about what's been going on and that you're worried about them and that you need to step up and be the voice in their life because you're losing them. Your 3,000 men moment may be that you need to head to CR and give up that addiction that is holding you back. You just need to take that next step. You may be sitting in here, you may be watching online where you have given up on church and you're just ready to walk away from this whole thing because you stretched out to the max and God's just saying, take a step, take a step. Take a step. And if you take a step, God could change your entire life. Up to this moment, can you imagine being Peter? You've lost everything. You've denied the Savior of the world. I mean, who does that? That's a want to get away moment. 
And all of a sudden, he takes one step, and God uses him to write almost the entire New Testament with Paul. Why? Because he had the courage to step up and go, men of Jerusalem, I'm just going to take another step for God. Can I ask you a question? Are you sitting in here today just weary and tired and worn out to where you feel like you can't take one more step towards God and you are so ready to just embrace the ground because the ground is a sure thing. Let me tell you, man, the ground is shifting sand. You will find yourself in six months begging to have your eyes fixed on Jesus again because that is a distraction that will destroy you. Satan wants your eyes there. He cannot win the war, but he can win a battle. And my question is, are you going to let him win? Or are you going to firmly fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and the finisher of your faith? Do me a favor for a second. Just bow your head and close your eyes. You may be sitting in here right now and just going, man, that is me, Matt. I have quit. I have stopped. I, I've looked down. I have, I have quit trying. I, I've been distracted. I've, I've taken my eyes off because I was at that max moment. Man, can I tell you something? That's okay. I've been at the max moment. Everybody has. I'm not sure I'm not close there right now. But in the max moment, take that step. What does your step look like? It's unique to you. It's not like Peter's. It's not like Matt Bardick's. It's not like somebody else's. It's unique to you. You have a certain step. What does that step look like for you? What does God need to do in you right now? Here's what I just want you to do. Here's your first step to the next step. You ready? If you know that you are at the max and you are ready to quit and God is calling you to save your marriage, to fix what's going on at work, to work with your children, to, to pray for your kids, to get involved here, to give church another chance, whatever that next step is, and you feel like, man, that rubber band is going to bust, I'm here to tell you, like Peter, take that next step. And here's what I want you to do. If you're ready to take it, don't raise your hand for me, but raise it for God right now. God, I need you to fix my life right now. I need to know that if I take this next step, you will fix my situation. Don't raise it for me. Raise it to God in humble obedience. God, I want to be fixed by you. I want you to help me take the next step. I want to be used by a, like a guy like Peter. But I am ready to quit, God. I am ready to give it up, and you just need to know that. But I will take that step. Just lift your hand. You're not lifting it for me. You're just lifting it in obedience to let God know. Father God, there are hands all over this room, and it is because you are calling us to more. God, you are not satisfied when we live a distracted, look-down life. God, may we look up and fix our eyes on you, the author and the finisher of our faith. God, may you work inside of these people that have raised their hand. God, in humility, they raise their hand to you and they admit that they are stretched to the max. Would you show them that next step? God, would you give them the courage to take that next step? And would you begin to use them in mighty, miraculous ways? In your name I pray, amen. You need to know something. If you raised your hand, the moment Peter stepped fo forward and said, men and women of Jerusalem, was one of the moments in which he became one of the biggest Bible figures of all time. It was just that one small step. That small step you raised your hand about, don't neglect it, take it. Because who knows what God will do through you. God of creation There at the start Before the beginning of time With no point of reference, you spoke to the dark and fleshed out the wonder of light. And as you speak, a hundred billion galaxies are born in the vein.
be seen. When we're laying on our deathbed, you're not going to worry about how much money you had, how much power you had, how much prestige. You're going to see that that was all game, that that was all an illusion. The only thing that's going to matter is the impact you had on other people's lives. We are all on a separate journey. But the beautiful thing about our life here on this earth is at my funeral, they ain't going to talk about my success. They're going to talk about who Nick was and how Nick lived and how Nick loved and encouraged. Success is incredibly important, but even more important than success, it's having an impact. It's knowing you haven't walked the planet in vain. It's knowing that because you've been here, you've blessed lives, you've developed people, and you have made the world a better place. The effect you have on others is the most valuable currency there is. Everything you gain in life will rot and fall apart and all that will be left of you is what was in your heart. Life is a mirror. And life gives us not what we want. Life gives us who we are. When you were born, you cried while the world rejoiced. Live your life in such a way that when you die, the world cries while you rejoice. So I think in life, we're called in a couple different ways. We're called personally to stretch farther. But I think we're also called as a church to constantly look at how and where we can stretch farther. I, I want to show you a couple pictures, and then I want to tell you a story before I let you go today. I want to show you a quick pic, the very first one of our first day together. Can you show that to them? This picture, if you don't know it or have never seen it before, that's, that's Daniel when he was 12 years old. <laughs> and that is uh, February 2nd, 2013. That is the very first service of North Road Community Church. Since then, we've gotten to see 400 people like Mike get baptized and give their life to Jesus. We've gotten to see as many as 1,200 people come in here on a Sunday morning to hear about God. We have right now probably 31 kids who are either being fostered or adopted in our church. It's worth clapping for. We have seen countless people who've walked away of a, from addiction because of Celebrate Recovery. We've seen some really cool stuff happen. Now, why do I say all that? Because at the end of five years, if I'm just being honest myself, I think you get a little weary and a little tired talking about it. I, I, man, I, I get tired sometimes. I, Sarah Yates will tell you that she's always going, slow down, Matt, slow down. Right? And I, and I do. I need to take that Sabbath. I need to take that rest. But I don't need to quit. And neither does our church, because God has called us to so much bigger and so much more. And probably for the last eight weeks, I, well, no, I shouldn't say the last eight weeks, probably about three months ago, God started putting on my heart that there was a new chapter to happen. And I'm going, God, what's the chapter? I mean, what do you want to do in my life? And I, and I thought it was a personal thing. And I, to be honest with you, um, I, I just started really kind of recollecting, because in the past, if I'm just being 100% transparent, this is usually, don't freak out, but this is usually in the moment when God calls me to go somewhere else. And so I'm going, God, am I supposed to go somewhere else? And I'm going, no, this isn't the time to do that. And it's weird. Satan will always put distractions. He'll always put down distractions. The church that I couldn't get a job in five years ago that some of you guys have heard me talk about have offered me that job three times in the last three months. 
And I'm like, no, I'm not supposed to do that. I'm supposed to be at North Road. This is, this is where I'm supposed to be. Satan will put distractions in your life when you're trying to fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. And so I, I, I just have been going, God, what is that next chapter? What am I supposed to do? What is North Road supposed to do? And I've been feeling really, really unsettled, just being honest with you. And probably about three months ago, I walked into Sunny Street Cafe where Jesus always moves. <laughs> and if he doesn't, after I eat, never mind. Anyway. And I was sitting with Darren Kassebaum, and I was getting ready to just vomit on him all of this, right? I was just ready to go, this is what's going on, blah. And Darren, I, I, just, I mean, I'm ready to open my mouth, and as I go to open my mouth, Darren puts his hand up and goes, dude, wait. And I said, what? And he goes, I was having my quiet time two days ago, and God told me to tell you specifically to look up from the weeds, because he's about to do a new work in your life. I'm like, what the heck is that? What, what's he doing? And so we talked about this for a few minutes, and I came back to church, and, and about three days later, my old youth pastor, not one that worked for me, but my old youth pastor, the one I had when I was a little kid, um, some of you know him, comes in, and he just wants to see the church because he's just celebrating what God's done here. It's pretty cool. And, and, and he goes, you know, I got a church like this. It's about this size. And I said, really? Because I've never been to his church. And he goes, yeah, it, man, it, it, it will seat 1,200 people. I said, really? I said, how's it going? He goes, man, there's 55 people left. And he goes, Sunday, we didn't even have a child in the room. There was nobody in the children's ministry. There wasn't a student there. It was 55 older people. And I went, really? And he goes, yeah. And he goes, I really think there's a, I really just pray that, you know, my job here has just been to hold for it and that somebody would come and adopt us. I kind of looked up from the weeds and I'm like, Okay, is this, this that moment, God? Is this that moment where you've been talking about where we know what the next phase is for North Road, what we know what's coming next? Because you got to understand, if you've not been coming to North Road for a long time, here's some things we said. We are going to reach families unabashedly. We are going to go after orphans. We're going to set up a place to, to adopt them. We're going to go after people who have drug addictions. We are going to do everything we can to minister in the community. And then we're going to start campuses in order to minister to more people. And that's always been our goal. But I didn't think it'd be this fast because we just built this. And now are we going to have enough money to go start another campus? I mean, that just doesn't happen. And here comes this guy in the door, and he looks at me, and he goes, no, yeah, I'm telling you, we, I, I think our people would do it. They'd love to be adopted. And so I just called the North American Mission Board. It helped us start North Road. And they said, man, we would love to help you. So you got to understand something about North Road. When I started it five years ago, I came from a lot of larger churches, every church of which gave us a ton of cash to start this, this, this work, about a half million dollars over five years. I called every one of them back, and every one of them said, dude, if you do that, we're 100% in. Really? Yeah, we are. We, we believe in what you're doing. We want, to keep, we want to keep going. So me and the elders, we go down and we look at this church. I'm going to show you pictures of it here in a minute. Um, but we go down and we look at this church and we meet with them. And you've got to understand something. If you know me very well, I'm the most black and white person you'll ever meet in life. I will not hide anything. You will know what I'm thinking because I'll just tell you. And, and I really felt like if we were going to take over this church, these people needed to know, man, it is going to change. It's not going to look like it does because right now it looks like an older church, right? Fair? And, and I went in and I sat down with them and I talked. And here's what I told them. You can ask the elders. They kind of tease me about it. But I looked at them and I said, if we take over your church, there's two ways to tell a person they're going to get a mohawk. So I told them. I said, I can cut all the sides of your hair off, bleach it white and spike it up and flip you around and go, like your haircut? Or I can look at you and go, here in a minute, I'm going to shave all the sides of your hair off. I'm going to bleach it blonde, and then I'm going to spike it up. And then when I get done, I turn them around, and they're prepared in their heart to see a mohawk. And I said, I want you to know you're going to see a mohawk. And this little lady, she goes, can we keep a stained glass window? And I went, probably not. <laughs> Just being honest, because I wasn't going to lie. And I thought, God, if you're in this, it will happen. 41 people were there that night. And you know, you, sometimes in churches, they'll do a hand raise vote, and these little people, these, these little old ladies and men that are 60 to 95 years old, wrote on a silent ballot whether or not they wanted us to take over their church. And they voted 40 yes and one no. How does that happen? Because I would think if I told you you couldn't have your stained glass window, you'd write, You stink. I hate you. Go away. <laughs> I don't want a mohawk. You're a moron. I mean, you know. You can write anything. Nobody's going to know who you are. It's silent and anonymous, 40 to 1. 
So we're going to have a meeting tonight at 5 o'clock as a church, and we're going to talk about this more in depth on what this means. Um, <laughs> they are ready to sign all of the assets of their church over to us. They owe $24,000 on their church, of which I had a person in the first service come up and go, I will write a check for that. So with your all's approval tonight, we will start North Road Harvester Campus, and this is their church. Right now, it looks like an assisted living facility. <laughs> I'm just being honest. It kind of does, doesn't it? And we're going we're gonna to put stone on it and change the color of it and make it completely different. It seats 1,200 people, and it sits right off of Highway 94 on, uh, this is funny. You got to stop here for a second. We were meeting with them. They go, hey, if you fix our church up, will you fix our stove? I go, well, you guys are ahead of us. We don't have a stove. So, so anyway, but this is their church. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's incredible um, how big this place is and how much these people really want to see God move. And if you guys vote it, like I said, this will become North Road Harvester Campus. How that looks, I don't know. But here's what I know that it looks like up front. I know we'll have more than 31 kids adopted and taken into foster care by people who love Jesus. I know that we'll have more people in CR that are giving their life up away from addiction and giving their heart to Jesus. I know that we will reach families unabashedly in that place. You want to hear something crazy? In a 10-mile ring around North Road Community Church here, there might be, and I'm just guessing, maybe 70,000, 80,000 people. In a 10-mile ring around that church is 411,000 people. Now, as a church, we can sit here and go, man, we are maxed. Or we can just close our eyes, put out our hands like Peter and go, men of Jerusalem. There is a God who loves you. And we want you to know him. And man... Be here tonight at 5 as we talk about it because this is a new chapter for us. And I really think this is when God begins just to blow the lid off of what he's doing through North Road. Man, if God is working in your heart and today you were like, man, I'm at that step. There'll be people down here you can pray with. Come and see them. There's a takeaway card as you walk out the door. Don't quit on this one. The stretch farther one is probably the most important one because the moment you let the elasticity come back is the moment you stare from the sky and you start looking at the dirt. And the dirt is distracting. I'll see you tonight at North Road. Have a good one.